Okay, I guess we'll get started now. I want to thank you all for coming to this year's independence panel. The first thing I want to do is, uh, starting at the far end of the table, is have everybody introduce themselves. That's you, sir. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. My name is Brian Taylor. I have been a animation and visual effects professional for about 20 years now. Uh, recent projects include all of the phase one Marvel movies and I'm currently doing development at Marte Studio. And thanks for coming today. My name is Hannibal Tabu. I am the weekly columnist at Comic Book Resources on the Bipal. I'm writing Wassa Will to Power for Stranger Comics. I'm writing Project Wildfire for Legends Press. And I'm the 2012 Top Cow Talent Hunt winner who wrote Artifacts number 35. And I'm mostly sober. <laughs> Hi, uh, Dale Wilson. Um, I've done uh, indie comics publishing, indie comics writing, uh, online, offline, whole nine yards. Um, but my day job is I do marketing, so um, that's generally the perspective that I come at everything with. So I will apologize up front for that. I am... Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm, sure. um, I'm Danny Dixon. Um, I've been doing uh, indie comics for about six, seven years. Um, my company is called Tumble Creek Press, and I've created a few series, 13 and MISing, and then I have a new series coming out called Five Nations later on this year. Um, I do um, some occasional blogging. Um, I give way too in-depth uh, impressions of my favorite TV shows on a show on a thing called Danny's DVR. Um, and um, yeah, and I've sort of branched out into a few things like web series and, and some film stuff. I'm slightly the oddball out on this panel. Uh, my name is Melissa Jarvis, and I write uh, time travel, historical, paranormal, and urban fantasy, and I'm published in those areas. Um, I do not write comics, but thanks to these wonderful guys, I've been introduced to the world of uh, indie comics, and I'm also with a smaller press publisher, so I do have that experience, and I've also been in public relations for over 16 years, so I have that perspective as well. My name is Robert Roach. I am an illustrator in the entertainment industry. Uh, was the inaugural uh, Rising Star uh, Glyph Award winner uh, for a couple of different. I do a couple of different comics. I work as a storyboard illustrator, in animation, live action, and uh, other than that, occasional pain in the ass with a lot of the people up here. That's <laughs> And I am Dwayne Copeland. I'm a writer, producer, director, editor. I'm a co-creator and producer of the web series CB Nation. It's a superhero web series, and I am currently writing a novel called The Adventures of Jarrell Sunstormer. So what we're going to cover today will probably be a gamut of entertainment, animation, and comics. The first thing I want to find out is how many of you have been to our panel before? Okay, so if you have questions already, um, feel free to, to add to, um, to ask those questions at any time, but we'll go ahead and get started. The first question I'll give to the panel is, I have an idea for a comic book. Should I do an ongoing series, a mini series, or a graphic novel? Don't all rush. It depends uh, on a number of different things. It depends, well, Short. It depends on you. What do you have available to you? What people do you have available to you? Uh, with the writer's journey, they talked about writing something, and then if you have to have an uh, artist assist you in the completion, well, do you have that available to you? If you have an art group, can they designate enough time to get it done? These are a lot of different things that only you can explain and then go into whatever it is you want to tell. Some stuff can be told as strips. 
Some, told, some stuff has to be told by page. Some of those pages can only be told as a clump. It's on you. How you want to look at yourself and your property will dictate a lot of those answers. Uh, I think also um, with that, um, you know, earlier also they said, about, you know, like people won't read scripts, but you as the creator, since you're the first, the first line in this, uh, need to figure out how big of a story you actually have because you're like, oh, I love this so much. But th there's not actually a correlation between how much you love it and how much story is there. Um, there's, um, so, you know, however you do that, whether that's you do uh, outline, whether you do world building, you know, um, one of my series, it, it got kind of so massive that I was like, I can't even start writing yet until I figure out what this entire world is. So I had to figure out a, you know, a platform to f do all the world building. And then from there I knew how big it was and how much story I had to tell. But you could create a really giant you know, world and, and it's really a short. So you, know, um, you need to figure that out as well before you start getting all these people excited about a project. And you're like, actually I just need you to do three pages. You know, versus I need you to do 120 pages of art. Do, do whatever's most appropriate for the story, whatever the story needs to do, how, however long it has to be uh, to, to fulfill the story arc and, and everything that you need to say. That's, I, mean, I think that's the, the gist. I will say from a novel writing perspective, it's slightly different. Um, what publishers want to see um, is that you have more than one story in you. So if you are pitching a book um, and you have it in mind as a series, by all means, pitch the series and hopefully you better have at least book one fully written and book two or book three mapped out. To piggyback on what Dale was saying, uh, when you're writing something, even if it's a really big idea, sometimes it can be broken down into smaller individualized chunks. Uh, with both fiction and comics, the market being what it is, there can be challenges selling uh, a longer work, which has a longer development cycle for you as an individual, which means that's time that you're not working on things that you could be making money at. Um, and which also means time, you know, off the market that you can't be looking at other work. So in that regard, <clears throat> one of the things that I like that, uh, what was his name? The guy on Noble Causes, what was his name? Uh, Jay Ferber, thanks. He did a series of miniseries that then was so successful that it went on to become an ongoing series, which was good for his business in the terms of, well, oh, I just got to pay this guy for four issues. Boom, done. I gotta pay this guy for issues, boom, done. And he was able to constantly keep working the business side of it more successfully. With uh, the new project I'm doing, plug, plug, for Stranger Comics, Wasso, uh, Will to Power, it's a series of small chunks of a larger story. So I've got the entire thing written, and they're just releasing chunks of it at a time for 99 cents on Amazon, for free on their website, yada, yada, yada. So you can keep it serialized, and you can keep getting it in a way that is more economical. Uh, the story itself, as a whole, you have to tell as long as you can. But how you actually package it and sell it to people, well, that's a whole different party. Yeah. And Brian, if you want to add to that on animation or you know entertainment, you know, would it be a web series or feature or short? I think with anything, it's um, like he was Hannibal was saying, it's how are you going to package it? How is it going to work? Is it going to translate into animation? Is it going to translate into live action or TV? You have to think about how your projects kind of translate into a real world thing. Like you might see a costume in the comic book, it's not going to work the same way in real life. It's going to look different. So you have to think about that and know the process. Know the process. If you're going to do animation, learn the pipeline, learn those things like that. Because if you do it all the wrong way, it's going to come out horrible. And now the question on everybody's mind, can I make money at this? Will I make money at this? Um, sure. If you just, you know, sure or no. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, seriously. I mean, there, there, there are people that don't, um, that don't set out to make money. They, you know, it never comes into their mind. Um, you know, money, profit. Um, these are not dirty words, even with respect to independent art. 
Um, making money actually means you get to make more art. Um, but um, you have to, you know, decide when you're going to put that hat on and then you keep it on. Um, you know, really, I, I have a personal rule about um, shows. I, I, I don't buy any big four stuff at shows. I only buy indie um, stuff. I literally have a bag full of indie art that I bought at this show and I've only been here a few hours. Um, because I can buy, you know, if I were gonna buy some of the top, you know, big four stuff, I can buy that anywhere. Um, but people who put their hard earned money, like I have done at plenty of shows, to get a booth, you know, I might not see them anywhere else. I was at someone's booth and they had a really cool piece of art and I was looking at it and I asked someone, it's like, how much is that? And she didn't really know, but she was standing behind the booth. And then she asked somebody else behind the booth how much it is. And she's like, oh, and she tells me and she's like, are you gonna be here like tomorrow? Because it was really pretty and she didn't wanna take it down to sell it to me because she wanted to keep it on the table. Okay. If you only have one piece of art that's really good, you shouldn't be at the show yet. Also, don't talk yourself out of a sale. Because I, I, I was like, okay, that's fine. And I kept going, you know? Um, but once you start, you decide you're gonna make money, whatever that is, if you say, I'm gonna make a hundred bucks at this show. If you decide that, you probably will. If your stuff's halfway decent, if your stuff's not priced, crazy um because i've seen some like nine dollar 17 page books <laughs> and uh, it was like better black and white and i was like okay yeah that's not gonna happen but um did it over staples yeah i did it over staples but so you have to decide um how much you're going to try i mean every business can't like no business is psychic but if you decide when you decide it's going to be a business and then you treat it that way and you make a business plan and you stick to it and you make adjustments when you see it's not working, sure, absolutely you can make money. Um, or you can fail miserably. But... Okay. No one has I, I completely agree with everything Dandy just said. I mean, I, <laughs> she and I have been doing this about the same amount of time, um, give or take probably a month. Um, and and it's, it's all about what you want to get out of it. Um, if, if money is what you want to get out of it, then, um, then, then you have to be capable and, and willing to wear a bunch of hats um, that include, you know, being your, your own marketing guy, being everything that you need to be, your, bank, your own banker, etc. cetera. Uh, your, all of the C-level people, as they call it, as they say. Yeah. Um, you have to be the CMO, the CFO, uh, you name it. So, um, yes, you can make money. Uh, will you make money? It's all up to you. Really, uh, most people don't. Facts is a bad. Most people get into the game and they don't make money, and that's true. Uh, the difference between the ones that do and don't can be determination. Sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's a hundred other variables, but uh, if you've ever, have you ever read Douglas Adams? There was a part where uh, Ford Prefect says, we can't beat these guys, they want it more than us. We don't care, how can we win? And if you don't want it as badly as the next guy, chances are he's gonna beat you, and that's, you know, unfortunately, capitalism is a competitive sport. So, uh, you know, some people will make more money than others if they want it more badly. I mean, but 50% take another industry, for example, 50% of all restaurants fail. Every person that starts a restaurant can cook, right? Like, but, you, you know, I mean, like, I mean, they, 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 they can, they, they're not someone who's like, oh, I only have a mac and cheese and boiled water. No, that's never the person that does that, right? But those base level of skills are actually not in every person who decides they're gonna do that, you know, make. And then some people don't think about the bottom line. Um, but, but, you know, every industry has a huge failure rate. Um, and, and, and whenever it's your heart leading, you know, it, it gets tricky. Uh, the same thing goes with uh, book writing, basically. Um, we can probably, in I would say the next year we will be saying all hail Amazon. Um, however, uh, as they are eating up a lot of the uh, smaller independent publishing platforms that, that we've had, um, 
However, that being said, self-publishing still is a viable way to make your own money or go with a small press publisher who, you know, while they're not going to give you the huge advance up front, you're going to have a better royalty rate and they will also be more savvy with uh, ebooks and such, which has really changed how at least uh, traditional book publishing works. And of course, Amazon, as we may all know, has acquired Goodreads and, and Comixology. Comixology. Uh, yeah. So, to, uh, to major platforms for. <laughs> <laughs> Two major platforms for independent artists. Um, however, you know, if you do get in bed with Amazon, and pretty much we're all going to, um, you can make money as you, you, there are formulas out there that will tell you, okay, you have to price your novel at 99 cents, or you cannot go above $4, so you need to stay below that $4 mark, because people won't try out an author that they don't know, um, if it's anything higher than that, and that is pretty much true. Um, so where your money is going to come from, and at least in that respect, and you know, from my experience and from other writer friends, is the more work you can produce, the more books you have out there, the more money you will make. Do not expect your first book to make you a million dollars or even a thousand dollars. Okay, that was deep. Um, <laughs> should I self-publish, pursue a publisher? Do I look to Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, or Image? And for entertainment, do I go to the networks or to the studios? Uh, DC, Marvel, hell no. <laughs> it's off, the, just, it's done. If you have something original, well, let's just put it this way. DC and Marvel, put them out of your mind because even if you're going to them with something that they own, the next great, Scarlet Witch story, uh, the next great Wonder Woman story. If you aren't in their network and part of their old boy, and it's just a little bit of old girl now, but old, if you're not part of that network, it doesn't matter how good your idea is, it's not getting picked up. I'm not trying to be a, a, a Debbie Downer, but they have, they're giving the work to the people that they have worked with. So take that off. Dark Horse, hey, you have a chance there. DH uh, Dark Horse Presents, maybe if you can get into that rotation, a short, cool. Um, maybe some of the other smaller uh, companies, but be careful with your rights. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, we're more than happy to publish your great next thing, but um, we get X amount of money, we share the rights with you, and if it goes into other media, uh, we'll give you a call as we develop it. So be careful with, in this regard. Not trying, to, not trying to dissuade you at all. I'm just trying to say, these are your options, here's how you protect yourself, and if you say, well then I wanna do it myself, the last answer as far as how you can approach that can be your guide. Um, I won't give what I will do because I have very strong opinions on this, but I would say just if you're starting out, um, in general, you know, diversify your portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So you should always be writing anyway. So have a couple of ideas that you'd be like, I don't care if they gave me money for this, I give away 100% of the rights, I don't care if they take my name off it, they can, you know, ignore me in public, and you have a couple of those. So, and then you have something you're like, ah, you know, somewhere in the middle. Like maybe you develop with an artist, you each share rights, they do the art, you do the thing, you co-create. And then you have some things that are your baby. You're like, not unless I get a check for this amount, um, I retain all my rights in every medium, whatever. And then you have a sort of a rotate, you know, you sort of have a, uh, options for yourself. Um, and that way, um, should the, the opportunity present itself, not with, you know, DC and Marvel, but, you know, an IDW, an image, a dark horse, 
um, a boom, um, you have something that you can have a conversation without being like, you know, I'll only let you have this movie if I direct and my cousin is producer, and you know, like you have all these things attached to it. Um, I think that's probably the smartest way. If you know, if you're just, if you're just starting out, um, try it that way, and that way you have you know whatever hits hits. And again, I'm going to kind of emphasize that you learn about the process and know about the process. You can go to uh, the copyright office. You can go to the WGA. Register your stuff online for no more than thirty dollars, and have a basic protection to go from there. I mean, that's the whole point of independence is being able to do yourself and not go to the usual routes of having to go through all of these steps. But again, learning the process is so important. Learning how to protect yourself, learning how to protect your work. You have to treat yourself as an, um, treat yourself as a professional and kind of conduct yourself as one because again, you're not the only one trying to do these type of things. But if you learn this stuff beforehand, it'll pay off in the long run because this is the way you're gonna have to do it. Um, I was, I don't know if fortunate is the right word because I worked my ass off, to get a book on image uh, this year with Artifacts 35 after winning the Top Cow Talent Hunt. Um, and I have been paying attention to the machinations of these companies for a while. Uh, Marvel's, at least in my particular demographic looking at things. Marvel's hired one black writer since 2009. DC's hired none since 2011. Uh, there were multi-year spans between there. So for me, that was a consideration. Uh, an editor at Marvel told me in 2006 that if you haven't proven that you can sell X number of units in another medium, we're not interested in you. So chasing Marvel and chasing DC won't work because they chase who they want to make money because they're a business. They have corporate overlords to answer to. Uh, as we mentioned, Dark Horse has a completely different idea. Dark Horse is like, we'll play. Maybe you give some rights, maybe you won't. Let's see what happens. They'll negotiate with you. So that's a different company to work with. And Image is a very, uh, Image is there as a very good window, but you have to do a lot of your own marketing. You have to do a lot of your own stuff. I was once told it's not a deal for the faint of heart. So if you're, getting, if you're chasing down an Image deal, yes, you can get in there with five pages that are solid and that they believe in, but you're just starting to climb there. Whereas you, you don't get the support of a publisher the way that James Robinson would, who was in this room two hours ago, or that Brian Michael Bendis would, yada, yada, yada. However, several of these people started out as independents. Brian Michael Bendis was drawing incredibly crappy comics. Um, <laughs> and that's his words, not mine. Uh, uh, before you know, he got picked up, quote unquote, by Marvel. Uh, Kirkman was doing Battle Pope for the love of pie before, you know, you know, exactly, Funkatron, Rapper, Rapper. Uh, and he was very independent minded, and he still does that, as I said in the last panel, that Clooney model. One for the company, one for me. One for the company, one for me. So, Christopher Priest, uh, who was one of the first uh, black editors in, in Marvel or DC, talked about the difference between doing art for commerce and art for art. And you have to decide which one you're going to do. Uh, they're not always the same, they can be the same, but it's sometimes a tough climb to make that, those two things reconcile. So I wanna find out, um, what did you come to this panel to get? And are we giving that to you? Do you have questions that we haven't covered yet? Go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, do, well, first of all, do you want a free bag for asking the first question? Uh, free bag! Uh, I'm not a very good thrower, so. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, tips for marketing. Um, I mean, the, the, the first most basic uh, thing is, is have a website and, and be very conscious. So one of the things we talk about in digital marketing all the time is, is um, uh, kind of reputation management, right? So kind of understanding that everything you post online, and I, this, I'm, I'm horrible at this myself, so anything you post on Facebook, Instagram, the whole nine yards, that's, that's the way the world sees you, right? And that's how people are gonna latch, they're gonna apply these things about you, right? Um, it's reputation management. Um, but build a, build a website, have you know all, those, all the, the basics in place um, that talk about you, your bio, the whole nine yards, that kind of thing. 
Um, that's that's the first, that, and that's that's before you even. Uh, I would say before you even start talking to people, because it's a certain level of professionalism. Um, uh, that's that's the first thing. Um, and and you know when you go to Facebook, talk about comics. Like, like start start digging in. And and marketing is is a it's a backwards and forth thing. Right? It's it's a communication um, with an audience often. Um, so uh, you know talk to people. Um, Sitting in this room asking that question, that's what you've marketed yourself already, right? You've put yourself out there, people will recognize your face, hopefully you'll come to our next panel and I'll recognize you and we'll talk and have long conversations about marketing. So <laughs> that's, that's the first step right there. I mean, that's reputation management. You know, know that everything you do online and, and when people see you, that's, it's really important. There is a fine line um, between um, public relations and marketing, I will say. Social media has kind of blurred the lines. That saying, there is also a fine line between um, self-promotion and bugging the hell out of people. Um, pretty much on Facebook, the biggest pet peeve I have heard, um, for instance, from authors like um, I'm trying to think of somebody who you might know, Sherilyn Kenyon or uh, Sylvia Day. You friend them, and then they accept your friend, and then first thing that you do is you go and promote your book on their page. They hate that. Every single writer hates that. It, we feel like we're being used. That being said, what you want to do is build up you know, sort of a relationship, talk about subjects that you have in common, and then promote your book that way. Look for specific groups, um, you know, on social media that, you know, are set up towards what you're writing, but don't spam all your friends. Um, you know, traditional media is still operating, you know, the way they have for probably about the last 20 years and you know what they're interested in more is the feature aspect um, not exactly what it is you're writing or what it is you're doing but what's interesting about you why are you doing this um, it's more of the human interest element um, so that still holds true I find with regular media but with social media you know Use it, but use it wisely, and don't use your friends just straight for self-promotion or, you know, befriend big authors or follow them in tw on Twitter and then immediately just spam them with your links. Um, also, I just, uh, you know, Dale and I literally have an entire panel just on, you know, what you need to do, um, but, but, but briefly, just, I think, um, you know, there, there are a number of platforms right now and don't try and bring it beyond all of them. Um, find the one that's comfortable for you and then find a space that you like talking about. Um, I, uh, you know, my blog, which I actually is on hiatus, I actually pulled back on because it actually, I love television, you know, I write comic, most people know me, most people that have met me know me for comics. A lot of people online knew me for what I thought about certain TV shows. And I actually went in for a job with, um, you know, uh, a woman who I've admired for like 20 years and I really wanted to work for her. And she's sitting there with my stuff and she's like, and I was like, so do you want to read this? I brought this. And she's like, I just, I just, I really feel like from your blog, I, should I be watching Scandal? I feel like I should be watching Scandal. And I was like, and, and, and that became, like that became the conversation and then the interview was over and I was like, I didn't get to talk about myself because the thing that's most read, was read, most read online about, for me, I mean now that's not a negative thing per se, but it became what, I, like it got way more, like it got way more views than like my comic book blog and my did, did you other job. I did not get the job. Oh. <laughs> I did not get the job. But, um, but you know, but she's a fan of my uh, blog. Uh, <laughs> but you know, so I mean, and maybe I wouldn't have gotten the job anyway. But uh, but you know, that's what she became known for. So you know, just what you talk about most, how you talk about things, 
um, becomes, you know, like you said, what your reputation is. Don't get into politics unless you want to be the person who talks about politics. Because it's really difficult to have an in-depth conversation in 140 characters. It's really easy to start a flame war though, right? So is that what you want to be known for? Is anyone, based on your political views, gonna then buy your comic books? Not unless it's political satire. So um, pick a medium, um, find a community in there, post regularly, whatever that is, and 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 be truthful. Like so, um, I happen to like talk about television a little too much, but I found something that I like talking about. So it was very easy to build a rapport with a lot of people. Um, but just make sure it's kind of at least in the vein of what you want to, you know, talk about. Go ahead. Oh. He a fan of he a fan of Hannibal's. That's what he just said for y'all didn't hear. <laughs> and we are questioning his sanity at the moment. Shut up. Let the man talk. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. You're here, and I'm grateful for it. Thank you. What's on your mind? Um, I'm a freelancer. I work for at least two different companies. Uh, and I was just about to ask, how much abuse can you take? I do like layout design for a lot of the uh, books that I do for them, and sometimes they don't. They just throw all the work away, and they just decide to tell the artist, like based on the script. Like, do they pay? Like, that was actually going to be my first point. Yeah. The question, the question, wait, the question was, how much abuse can you take? Yeah. The question was, how much abuse can you take? No, no, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, I'll, I've, I've, uh, as a journalist, I've taken kill fees for articles I've worked months on. Um, I, I, the source still owes me six hundred dollars from something I worked on for years and years ago. Um, Vibe still owes me two hundred dollars for a review that it hadn't paid me for. Um, when you do the work and you pour yourself into it and you do the best you can, that's literally all you can do. Whether it gets to market or not is not something that's ultimately in your control as an artist. So um, when you're doing particularly work for hire, because again, there's a difference between art for commerce and art for art. Stuff that's for you is a whole different part. Take no abuse for that. It is yours and you deserve to be able to say what you want. But work for hire? Yeah, it's not really your party. So, I have three standards. One, did I get paid? If I got paid, I'm probably not gonna be that mad. Two, uh, did I learn something from the process? In creating the art, did I say, oh, I could approach this a different way, or, oh, okay, I'm doing something here over here, yada, yada, yada. Uh, a good example of this is, I'm working on an issue of Watson and Holmes with Stephen and Grant, Stephen Grant uh, and Dennis Calero, and it's taken forever to get this issue done. I swear to God, I finished what my part of it six months ago. But, uh, and now everybody's got eyes or not. Oh, now we went through script really fast. But, uh, <laughs> so, but I learned how to write a mystery. Uh, I, Stephen Grant has been writing comics since I was a kid, and he worked with me in the script. And I was like, I learned a bunch of crap here. So, whether I get paid or not, I know how to write mysteries now. Cool. Um, and finally, do I feel good about what I turned in? If you feel good that what you turned in is like, this is something that no matter whether it comes out or not, you would stand by it. If it pops up 20 years from now, you're like, yeah, I did that. Then you're really okay. Um, any abuse alongside a check as a, as a professional artist, unfortunately, is part of the job. And I'm sorry to say that, and I'm, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but yay, money. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this young lady got her hand Well, I mean, uh, you know, that person is now a contact, right? Like, I don't know how many people she saw for that thing, but she'll remember me as the, the woman who made her start watching Scandal, right? You know, like, she'll remember that, right? Like, I didn't get that job, but now it's like someone who's like, stuff I've been admiring for like, since I was like in high school, you know, I, I got to sit in her, you know, 
kitchen and have an interview with her and you know no she didn't read my stuff I wanted her to read but but she did read my blog which was on my resume right um, and that's the other thing if you put it on your resume someone's gonna look it up you know um, uh, if you put your site there someone's gonna look it up so um, you know if there's you know an opening on one of her shows you know I would feel fine you know emailing her or calling, you know, and saying, I'd really love to be seen for that. Um, so it's also, you know, always expanding your network. Um, always, um, you can make a million impressions, you know, online, and then you can make some in person. And you don't know which one's going to come first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been a lot of situations with me in my career where I've gone and interviewed for stuff and didn't get the job and then gotten called for something bigger down the line. And that happens a lot. It's just that it's not necessarily that they don't like you. It's just that you might not be a fit for that. And then something comes along bigger than what you thought it was ever going to be and just turns into something else. So it's about persistence and keep going. I mean, when I first started out in the business, I just wanted to work on the Star Wars movie. And everybody around me told me, you're never going to do that. And I did it in 2001 and went on to keep doing all. I've got like 60 movies to my credit. I've done things I've never, ever thought I would do. And uh, it's really about the persistence. And again, the whole point of the panel is independence. And it's finding that independence. You know, I went from trying to pitch animated shows and I got so tired of the door being slammed in my face. I went and found a studio. So now I don't have to use anybody's permission. I get on Skype and we work and we put stuff out. And again, it's networking. Find out, you know, learn about the industry. Find out the right way to do it. Seek out like-minded individuals because again, that just str strengthens your base to move on and move forward. Because the people I'm working with sitting out in the front row, there might be people you know in the scene. It's like the talent is out there. You just gotta find the right people to do what you need to do. But most of all, know the process. Um, learn how the right way to do things because that's going to help you in the long run and, and strengthen you as an independent artist and creator. Okay, this gentleman right here and then you. <clears throat> well, I would like to handle the points about so how to handle freelance abuse. I think the fourth point to that is do they hire you? Mm -hmm. Because even if they abuse you and throw your work away, they still like it. They just don't want to use it. And, and you shouldn't take it to heart and say, well, I didn't do a good job. If they're rehiring you and still paying you to do your job, then you're doing okay. You're just not doing exactly what they want. So don't take it too much to heart to pay for it because it's, it's your job. And not everybody succeeds at their job every single day. Or it could be that uh, their, business, their business model has changed yeah. suddenly and what you did no longer applies to what they're going to do going forward. You know, yeah, and, and extenuating so, thick skin is, is requirement I, in I'm, this industry. I'm an, I'm an account manager at, a, at a, an agency, right? And my job is to pitch to clients ideas on how to grow their marketing, right? Whether it be with the budget that they have or with new budget or whatever the case may be. I get shot down every <laughs> single week. Like, it's, that's, that's part of my job, right? That's just, that's just, it's, it's like, it's like turning out cars. It's like, it's just, you make cars. Sometimes it's the best car that can be made. And sometimes there's going to be a ding. And then, you know, it, you get pitched, you have to pitch stuff all the time. You, you have to take the abuse. It's just part of the industry. And it, it sucks. You know, I hate being turned down every single week that I talk to the clients. But I keep at it and I keep doing it. And they keep paying me to keep doing it. So, I'm sure y'all have heard the old saying, if rejection makes you a better person, then I must be a saint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't. And Sarah, what was your question? Yeah. My question was that um, before you as creators develop like body of work and a reputation with the industry, how did you, when you had projects like prior to collaboration, um, where, was, where were your richest sources of Okay, oh, I can't do this. One? This is my favorite can, thing to do. In can I take this one? Sure, go ahead. Okay, writers, please stand up. Yeah, yeah, he's got it. Okay. Thank you. Artists, please stand up. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. that one. You all need to talk to each other. It, it's right there. It's how I met everybody on this panel is just by just shaking hands. Yeah. 
you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. more people like you right outside the door. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm lucky because I can do it myself and I don't have to deal with knuckleheads. It really, except for myself, <laughs> I look at the hair. Yeah, well, there are some bros up here. Yes, yes. You mean Hann Hannibal, Hannibal has written a, a three parter that kicks much tailbone, and we're going to finish that off once my inker finally gets. I, I had to deal with an inker with this one. That's why it reminds me it's so much better to do it myself. Uh, and so uh, it, it is a way to show different parts of the industry, different parts of the independence, whether you're doing it completely by yourself or the writers who stood up. I liked it when, uh, so Dale used to say writers would lift with your right hand or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I just would say and basically writers put your right hand up. Artists lift your left hand, your and, left then you hand see, and then you can see you can see who who's out there. Yeah. And, and just treat each other with mutual professionalism. And sir, you had a question. You, you you keep writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you just you just keep writing. It's I mean, and the only way to dig yourself out of a hole is to keep digging. Well, it's not so much getting stuck as much as just too much going on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> First, uh, the story. Well, yeah. I was gonna say that. You have like six minutes, so <laughs> exactly. Um, write out the first draft. Get it all out of your system because it doesn't, all, first drafts are irrelevant. All the real work is done in editing. So whatever is in your mind, throw, vomit it all out. Because once you write out that first draft, you may actually have five stories. You may actually have two stories. You know, you can chop it up into whatever pieces that you need once it actually exists. Because as long as it's sitting in your brain, oh, it's stressing me out, I don't know what to do with it. You know, you can't really work with it. Once you have actual words that you can edit into different formats and whatnot, then you're working with, oh, this is actually, I've got this superhero story over here and I've got this detective story, and oh my God, is this Astro City? And then you, you start to look at it. Go ahead. Then the second thing you need to do is find an editor. Yes. Because editor's job is to not care what you want, but to make it good and make it publishable. Yeah. And there are many editors, Dale's an editor, Dale, I mean, editors my friend Vince, editors. you know, there's people that you can work with who are writers or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Here, here, your editor. You go. There you go. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> do you know how many revisions my first book went through before it got published? Was it more than one? Yes, it was more than one. We are probably talking about 15, and I had to cut scenes that were near and dear to my heart, and it felt like I was, you know, killing my own child, almost. Um, however, it is necessary. You're going to have to be ruthless. You are going to have to be like George R. R. Martin no, and kill <laughs> off your characters, kill off your scenes. Because, you know, if you're writing a book, most publishers are looking for between 90,000 to 100 words for a first book. And if you give them 500,000, they're not going to look at it. And uh, it same sounds thing like as screenplay writing. Same thing as screenplay writing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it sounds like you have a really good problem, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, darn, I have to keep writing. Yeah. That's uh, great. Uh, keep going. Together. Yes, ma'am. You didn't expect to have your answer when you walked in here, did you? But see, see how they, uh, this how they up in here, man. I'm sorry, I had an ebonics one. Okay, uh, anybody else? Yes, sir. What's the hardest thing about starting a comic book, or is it getting a finished product? Are you talking about the process, the, the, the product, or? Okay. Thank you. 
Well, I mean, you have to cut it up into um, parts. You know, if it were film, you would have pre-production, production, production, and post, um, and then marketing. Um, Just like a lot of indie filmmakers, blood, sweat, and tears, max out their credit cards, sell their cards to get their movie made, and then have no marketing plan. Um, uh, You have to sell it. You know, you have to sell it to more than just your friends and family. Um, if you want to keep making it, um, uh, you can make five cents profit for the rest of your life. You can't lose five cents on every book for the rest of your life. You, you, you will eventually, you know, um, it won't, it's not sustainable. So, um, if you're not good at that, then find someone who is. Find them when you're starting the project. Say, you know what? I hate writing in 140 characters. But my friend does nothing but hang out on Twitter. Hey, you can be my marketing person. Can you do that? And I will wash your car. Whatever. You know what I mean? Like barter, um, figure it out, know what your strengths are. There's a lot of hats that you're going to have to wear, but you don't have to wear every single one. Um, But if you don't, if you fail to take care of that aspect of it, the only one who will ever see your books are your friends and family. Um, and, uh, and, and that's not what any storyteller wants. You want like as many people as possible to see it and to read it and enjoy it and feel something. Right. So, um, I think that's the hardest part for a lot of people. Um, mostly because they don't think about it enough. At what stage are you? (laughs) The the hardest part should be ever, whatever part you're working on right now. Like that, it just it's, it sounds like a really dumb answer, but that's absolute honesty. True. Because if it's if what you're working on right now is not hard, you're not working hard enough at it, right? Like that's people don't get that. Like you should be you should be really focused on what you're doing right right now. And and honestly, I say this on panels all the time. Don't think about the marketing when you're writing. Like that's. Because you, it's, it's scary, right? It's mm-hmm. frightening, and you start to shake, and you're, I mean, that's just me. But you, you, it's scary, right? If you're working on writing, you shouldn't be thinking about the marketing because that's a se- your brain's separated. You're doing something different. So that's that's whatever you're working on right at the moment. That's the hardest part. It should be. So. I'd like to interject just one thing. Is since we're here at WonderCon, how many folks are from the LA area? Oh, this this is really cool. Uh, um, this is uh, shameless, huh? Oh, see, you you're honorary, <laughs> honorary. That's all good, girl. Um, this is shameless plug moment because I can, and I got the mic in my hand. Uh, yes, yes. Um, if you want more of what we're doing today. If any of you were here for the writer's journey, a lot of good information. Uh, Those of you who have had an opportunity to to interact with us, uh, we'd love to do more of this. And you will have that opportunity March 8th and 9th. If you could, uh, I'm sorry, thank you, not March. May 8th and 9th, (laughs) if you come to uh, Cal State LA, dirt cheap, there's gonna be something called Eagle Con there on both days. Uh, so what, five dollars to get in or something like that? I believe it's ten dollars actually. If okay, you're not ten. A student. Yeah, if you're not a student, ten, or you can fake being a student because a lot of them are stupid there. So, uh, no, I, I love I love Cal State LA. It's all good. Um, yes, Facebook page and a website for more information. Uh, everybody you see up here will be uh, a part of it, and since the emphasis is on independence in varieties of publishing and entertainment uh, outlets, we can really, really get into it. There'll be panels there, there'll be people there, you can buy books there, you maybe will get some DVDs there. So if this is a continuation of a conversation you're hoping to have, you'll have that opportunity May 8th and 9th, Cal State LA and East LA is not like in the barrio of East LA thing. It's, it's East LA is all nice. People have misconceptions. So please keep that in mind, okay? Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming out um, and wrapping up, but I also want to point out that we are on uh, Facebook at The Antidote Trust. Yes. Yeah. Continue the conversation.
Continue the conversation there. Thank you. For and we have some swag, so anyone wants to come up and get some free books and credit cards. Yeah. Free stuff, yay! The antidotecrust.com. Thank <laughs> you.